I'm going to talk about some exciting things today, I hope, for all of you. Uh, I think you'll see some things that are at least inspiring, perhaps a few things that might be actual tools you could use yourself. And uh, maybe we can find some new uh, partners in crime for exciting new adventures in the future. I'm going to define participatory plant breeding, and I'm going to mostly refer to it as PPB, just so I don't spit at the microphone too much. Uh, first, we'll take a look at efforts in the old world where this began and where a lot of the development took place. And then we will take a quick look at all sorts of uh, PPB adventures all over uh, North America that have been going the last 10 years or so. I will put in a plug for the College of Menominee Nation and our very first scientific agriculture research project and then uh, summarize and go to questions. In agriculture, as uh, any of us who've uh, looked at a catalog of uh, garden varieties has ever noticed or anyone who's gone to buy some seed at the mill, there are a lot of different varieties out there. There are a lot of different crops that can be grown. Where did all this amazing range of adaptation and uh, adaptability, flavor and color come from? Squashes and cowpeas and maize and quinoa there, uh, among all the many, many others. Farmers did it. Farmers discovered this amazing tool about 10 or 12,000 years ago. Didn't always know exactly what it was or know how it worked but they employed it mightily, and that is to breed plants. Thousands of farmers in thousands of locations for thousands of years have saved seeds from among millions and millions of plants and over time developed land races or local populations, better put that here, uh, local populations that are adapted to place fitting uh, the growing environment as well as the food needs of the people who live there. There's a huge advantage to this, and it just happens by accident, it's just how it works. When you live in a place and you save seeds, you only save seeds from the things that will produce seeds. So over time, whatever you have becomes very well adapted to that place. It's just how it works. So even though farmers have rarely, if ever, used this terminology, which comes from you know, academic plant breeding, uh, the selection environment and the target environment, where those seeds are going to go, is the exact same place. So it's been very, very successful. It's why we have agriculture. Farmers did it. 150 years or so back, something started to change. So after 10 or 12,000 years, uh, we had colleges popping up all over the country and the world, and people wanted to start applying science to everything, including agriculture. And so, plant breeding has become professionalized. After they discovered inheritance, first in Czech and then again in France and the US and other places, universities, governments, and private plant breeders started applying this exciting new tool with intensive projects on specific important crops, but with very few people in very few places. You don't need to have a professional plant breeder on every farm. You can't afford one. And so we went to selecting for wide adaptation where the breeder would for a state or a big chunk of the country breed a variety that works across this huge area. So different than what farmers were doing. Because the new academic breeders applied new tools that pushed improvements more rapidly than what farmers were doing, eventually a lot of these commercial varieties replaced the land races and for the most part farmers have dropped seed saving and plant breeding, although this was just part and parcel of what we used to do. Formal plant breeding is really powerful and has been hugely successful, but it is not exactly the same. This is a key piece. The selection environment and the target environments are not the same. Plant breeders need to use special tools to figure out which things are widely adapted and what target environments they will fit. However, rest assured, if you are in a specific place, there's a good possibility no one is breeding varieties for your location. It just happens, especially as we've seen uh, plant breeding become, you know, 
more and more focused with, in fewer and fewer companies and universities. So which environments will be addressed is a very good question. Sometimes it's not ours. Now, regardless of whether farmers are doing it or academic breeders, the plant breeding process is the same. It's fairly straightforward. It's not rocket science. You know, don't pat me on the back because I went to school. I could teach you this in 10 minutes. You know, there's a few other things, but you know, the basic process is, is for kids. Anyone can get it. You set some goals. You decide what it is you want to accomplish. You find parents that have those traits and you cross them using the power of sexual reproduction to mix the traits up. Then you select among the best descendants from that new diversity. You evaluate them to see which ones met your objectives. And then you use it or you release it. Farmers and gardeners and kids can do this. Formal academic breeders can do this. They each have different tool sets and different viewpoints, but most anyone can come at it. What if farmers reskilled and took up plant breeding again? What if there was more collaboration with university breeders and farmers? What if minority groups and people living in out of the way locations and kids and other people would like to be part of plant breeding? What if we decided to try that and see what happened? This is all about participatory plant breeding. It is a new idea which is kind of in between these two because it is a dynamic collaboration between farmers and their skill set and their experiences and academic or institutional plant breeders and the tools they bring. Farmers have experience in the field. They know their area pretty well. They know their crops. Uh, frequently they know what the market wants. If they actually eat what they grow, they know what it should taste like and how it should cook up and the rest. Academic plant breeders have statistics and experimental designs and special tools for harvesting small plots and planting them and on and on and on. You can work together. Now, this idea was cooked up by social scientists in the 80s, but uh, our friend there, Salvatore Ceccarelli, uh, in, in the right in the center, he's the one who's really pushed this all around the world uh, in the 90s and, and since. So conventional plant breeding is supply driven. Breeders deliver new varieties and push them into the market and they hope the market takes them. They start with small plots bred from uh, diverging and segregating populations of, of a crop. Next. And they make their selections, the breeder selecting from generation to generation. Next. Eventually, things have blown up to a bit. We're only looking at the very best ones. Next. And then we release the best ones as varieties. Go ahead. These move to a certified seed production system of some kind, which varies from country to country. And then we hope that farmers will adopt them. Frequently they do, sometimes they don't. It's a little hit and miss. Okay. Participatory plant breeding is demand driven. The breeders go to the farmers and the farmers tell them what do we need. So we already know the farmers need this. Now any breeder could do this more often but sometimes there's been a little bit of disconnect. If you've never talked to a breeder directly then you know that you know, your needs are not getting transmitted. It's just like in the other one we're going to start with small plots from segregating populations uh, except they're going to be on farm. Next. Farmers all along the way are going to make the selections. Next. Eventually we've got larger plots of just the very best ones. Next. The farmers adopt them. So we've just cut off a few years. Immediately adopted by the farmers. And next. If the uh, seed certification system is open to it, these varieties can then be moved in and spread more broadly, but the farmers who took part already have the varieties they wanted. Okay, so Salvadori has worked all over the place. So here is a PPB project in Algeria, next. Italia, next. Ethiopia, next. Syria. Yemen, look at those beautiful terrace fields there in the mountains. Who'd imagine such a thing? Um, Salvatore's worked with women in I Iran. Next. 
He's also recently uh, started some uh, evolutionary rice breeding projects in uh, Nepal. And you can see here uh, a, a wide range of people from this village, all of different farmers have come together to come take a look and decide what's what and uh, what they like about it. So a great conversations had before they get to taking notes and making selections and putting things in packets. So a lot of, uh, a lot of community interaction can be a part of this. Uh, I think Salvatore should get the Nobel Peace Prize for all of this that he's done, it's amazing. PPB is not only a little bit faster, but it has this other advantage. In plant breeding, you start with genetic diversity and you move it through some sort of a system of selection. Conventionally, we move to uniformity. We take most of what's there and throw it out and we just go to a very few varieties that are broadly adapted and we try to sell lots of that. With plant, uh, participatory plant breeding, we uh, take uh, this population to a number of farmers, everyone's making selections, many different varieties come out. Diversity doesn't always yield much for you, but it does offer some additional possibility of finding resilience in the face of changing uh, growing conditions, changing weather, changing climate, uh, changing whatever. So there might be some additional resilience overall when we put out many different varieties in a region. So from a recent uh, paper from Salvatore Ceccarelli, uh, PPB has been tried around the world for 36 years plus, uh, 69 different countries with 47 different crop species. That's impressive. It is often faster and usually more varieties result. Uh, in some cases, it's astounding. Uh, his work in Syria, they put out, I, I, somewhere between 60 and 90 different varieties of small grains in about 10 years of time, which is just stunning. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see 90 different varieties of small grains here? However, the downside is, as exciting as it is for some of us, uh, scientists and farmers alike, most of the institutional breeders are still breeding exactly like they did. Uh, this has not been taken up and adopted all over the place. Seed laws, are really a tricky business. You know, we created them for a good reason. People were selling junk. They would sell anything in a bag and call it variety, whatever it was that you wanted. It could have good germination or bad germination, it could be full of weed seeds, and we had all said enough of that about 100 years ago and started writing these seed laws. However, that makes it very hard sometimes to release new varieties because you have to have incredible uniformity in the variety. You usually need someone to uh, carry this variety through a, a many, many different bureaucratic hoops to get it certified so you can put it out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy that most farmers aren't able to get through. Farmer reskilling and repossession of seeds is seen as negative by some. Does anybody here see a problem with farmers having seeds or having skills? Yeah, I didn't think there'd be any takers on that one. I don't understand where this concept comes from, but apparently some people have a vested interest in things staying like they are. Stay the course, uh, rather than investigate new possibilities, but there we are. All right, so we're gonna switch up gears and look at some places where this has been applied in North America. So it's just gonna be a brief update. No doubt a few of you have seen a few of these. I know a few of you have taken part in some of these. Um, if you've had a, seed, a garden seed catalog, you've certainly seen some things in those in the last few years. But hopefully there'll be something new and something exciting. Uh, if you haven't already been inspired to see what third world farmers can do with a, a little help from their Italian friend, I, I'm sure these folks will, uh, will move you to uh, some enthusiasm. Maybe you'll even want to jump in on one of the projects. Certainly it's not hard to contact any of the people I'm going to show you. So first is uh, some organic wheat breeding that went at Washington State University. Next. Okay, a group of farmers collaborated with folks from Washington State, the Jorgensons, DeLongs, and uh, Mr. Moore. And they collaborated with Steve Jones, the tall guy in the middle, and Kevin Murphy, the uh, bearded fellow on the right, as well as Jim Lammers from WSU. And here's what they did, and here's why they did it. 
Um, they were very interested in better organic wheat varieties because organic wheat growing is sometimes problematic. The number one problems would be, besides weather, would be weeds, I suppose. I think that's a problem with everything I've ever done. Um, they also wanted to see things that had extra high quality so they could try and push premiums in the marketplace. So farmers know what they want to get, and it makes a lot of sense. So the breeders, listening to that, figured out that perhaps the best parents to use would be some modern wheat varieties that would bring high yields, good standability, the latest in disease and pest resistance or tolerance. They crossed those with old wheat varieties, which were probably fairly well adapted to low input situations, which might mimic organic farming in general, and which also had very high quality, even though you know, the yields might not be what they were. And then after a few generations, they took these new lines out to the farms and let the farmers make uh, selections. They also made selections under their usual conventional system, because I'm sure the academic administration wouldn't let them just run wild. Um, what did they learn? Well, a few years ago, uh, Kevin and, and the team published a paper that demonstrated very clearly that the highest yielders under organic management are not the same as the highest yielders under conventional management. You can't predict one from the other. Rarely you'll find something that just never does any good anywhere, and even more rarely you'll find something that does good on both, but frequently the ranks will change. So it's important for organic farming to be able to uh, have evaluations done under organic conditions and perhaps do the selection under organic conditions. Uh, the PPV project identified at least one especially promising line that the farmers were excited about. The breeders were excited because it actually looked like it had broad adaptability. And last I heard, they were working to bring that through their usual system and, and release it. Organic Seed Alliance is probably the, the biggest water carrier for the PPV issue in North America. They've been all over the place. They're based in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but they have done so much in the last 15 years. It's truly astounding. Um, there's Nash Huber, a farmer on the left, and Michaela Colley, former director there, uh, evaluating some carrots during one of their projects. A few years back, they put out this. You can get it free online. It's the Participatory Plant Breeding Toolkit. If you or anyone you know is interested in participatory plant breeding, get this wonderful file. It explains the whole process and has so many nice pages for working through your plans and figuring out how you're going to do everything without having trouble later on. It's really worth it. Okay, a few of their projects for some highlights. First one's Dark Star Zucchini, which has been in the, uh, the seed trade for a few years now. Um, Bill Reynolds and Donna Ferguson uh, near San Francisco were uh, professional zucchini growers and they were growing a hybrid called Raven. Uh, maybe you've grown that one, it's a really nice one. It was perfect for, for their markets. However, there was a seed, a seed shortage one year, so they substituted Black Beauty, an open pollinated variety, which was similar. But they had a lot of off types. They didn't get the kind of uniformity of market type they're looking for, and so the whole crop wasn't worth as much. So that's a downer. So with the help of John Navazio from OSA, they crossed Black Beauty and Raven. They conducted mass selection for a few years, did some selfing, compared the different self lines, and they picked out the very best one and released it as Dark Star. It's uh, thought to be somewhat drought tolerant, and it is a really nice looking zucchini. So here's some pictures from the project. You can see uh, they have a fairly large patch of zucchini. I'm sure most of you would be horrified they have that many plants. They have an outlet. They don't have to hide it on the neighbor's steps. Um, <laughs> but the farmers did most of the, the pollinations and uh, just followed the directions with uh, Mr. Navazio and had great success doing this. All right, another uh, thing that's come out of OSA and their partnerships is the Novik project, Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. Everybody likes big long words and phrases. Um, you can read about them online and find a lot of their webinars and, and data sheets and, and no end of materials. 
most of this project, which has been refunded by USDA, I think three times around now, it's been going a long time, uh, USDA, OSA, and then university partners in several states, partnering with 30 plus organic farmers all across the country, and looking at a PPB for tomatoes, winter squash, cabbage, pepper, sweet corn, lettuce, fennel, kale, leeks. A lot of different crops, so it's really exciting. There's not been a lot of vegetable breeding all over the place like this in a while, so this is really impressive. One of the tools they've brought to it that is new to most of us is something called a mother-daughter trial. So the breeders on their stations are used to doing big, um, replicated experimental designs to evaluate things. It's hard to do that on farm if you're all there by yourself especially. So the mother-daughter design takes a smaller chunk of what's going on at the main station and is planted on the farm on a group of farms and then we have a feel for what things do on the farms. We get a lot of direct farmer observation and then also all the things that are done on the station like checking for uh, you know disease tolerance, uh, insect tolerance and, and whatever else that you know the scientists might do. So it's a pretty in interesting new thing uh, from this partnership. One of the things that come out of this is a variety you may have seen in the garden catalogs called Who Gets Kissed? Sweet Corn. Uh, it's, they're all very enthused I must say. The farmers involved in this project, uh, Martin Diffley and Scott Johnson in Minnesota, partnered with uh, a group of folks from University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Bill and Adrian and Pat, and then John Avazio and uh, Jared Zistro from OSA all took part in this project because it took a lot of people to do it, as you'll see in a second. Okay, there's Adrian in the middle and the rest of the crew as they're out there doing the evaluations. Uh, sweet corn evaluations are a lot more fun. I work with field corn and we don't usually taste it in the fall. <laughs> Not in the field. Okay, so what did they do? They did uh, PPB with two different breeding populations, each that had uh, the sugary enhanced trait, which is pretty popular because people have got a real bad sweet tooth and sweet corn is just, if it ain't sweet, no one's buying it. So they used modified ear to row selection, a technique developed after farmers quit saving seeds and working with corn, which is very efficient at uh, breeding. So they brought a new, a new trick. These populations, by the way, were just bred from uh, popular hybrids. So in case you didn't know, if you just take a group of hybrids and you mix them together, you have an open pollinated population. Ta-da! <laughs> Cat's out of the bag. <laughs> I always think it's so sad when people say, oh, you can't use hybrids. It's like, I'm a plant breeder. We use hybrids all the time. It's what we do. You make a cross and you make selections. Go, fly, be free. Um, the breeding objectives were identified by the farmers and knew specifically what they wanted. So they wanted to have varieties that were very vigorous to deal with weeds. Uh, they wanted uh, varieties that were tasty and tender with good ear fill. They wanted good shape. All these difficult traits that we field corn farmers never pay attention to. As well as good husk cover and resistance to, to uh, in important diseases. The breeders brought one other trick to, uh, to this project that farmers didn't used to do, which is a winter nursery. So if you know about this, you can do your work in the summer, send all your seeds in the fall down to Chile, you get another growing season accomplished, and they send you the seeds back in spring. That speeds it up, folks. It really is amazing, and it doesn't cost that much. I started doing this as a gardener, so I know uh, anyone who's interested, just let me know, I'll tell you about these guys if, you're, if you'd like to try. Anyway, after a few years, what did they find? Well, they improved flavor and tenderness. Big win there. Uh, husk cover didn't improve so much, but it was acceptable. And the late population did get taller, which in this case is good for dealing with weeds later in the season. So here they are evaluating uh, the different lines, measuring uh, and looking at the ear shape and everything. Another thing the breeders brought is managing all these different ear rows and the seeds in a pedigreed system. Most farmers have never done this. It's kind of annoying. You could learn to do it. But uh, the people at the universities are used to doing this, and if they want to, let them go. Okay, the late population was released as who gets kissed. The uh, early population is nearing release. And so the teamwork paid off in tangible ways with new varieties and then all the things that scientists like to do. Put out papers after discovering new valuable information and training graduate students. Okay, another project related to OSA 
is a new multi-state carrot project that's just gotten going. It's been going about one year. California, Washington, Wisconsin, and Ohio are t all taking part. OSA is going to lead the participatory side and the university breeders are going to do what they do separately. They're all going to select roots, send them somewhere to store for the winter, put them out for uh, recombination in the summer because carrots a two-year reproductive process and then they're going to repeat several years around. Then they're going to put out through their extensive trial network whatever comes out of these and then evaluate what happened when we did PPB as compared to doing the work on the university stations, what are the relative merits of each, advantages, disadvantages, and so forth. So again, we'll learn some useful scientific information and hopefully get some new carrots. All right, switching up a little bit. One of the people involved with the carrot project, Julie Dawson at University of Wisconsin-Madison, is the lead with uh, several others and also a tomato breeder, Keith Mueller, uh, working on the Tommy project or Tomato Organic Management and Improvement Project. Um, they're going to do trials in and out of structures, find parents that look especially good, make some crosses, and then uh, do PPB under each of these two scenarios and eventually put out advancing lines to farmers for final selections and variety release. Julie's also uh, involved in this next project, which is, I think, still looking for uh, full funding, but it is a a small grains project in Wisconsin with a different group of folks. They're going to look at variety trials and perhaps some uh, advanced breeding with intermediate wheat grass, which is called Kerns in some places. Uh, the newer, um, slightly higher yielding uh, perennial grass that seems to have at least some grain potential as a perennial grain. They're also going to do uh, PPB with uh, winter wheat, looking especially at Fusarium head blight and the standard things that we all would like to see with winter wheat on farm, you know, survivability, yield, and the rest. North to Canada, uh, how many of you have heard of Martin Entz? Okay, a few of you. Everyone should hear about Martin Entz. Martin's been exceptional and impressive because unlike most researchers across North America, he's actually taken up organic agriculture as an interesting thing to study. And he's done a lot of it, uh, studying uh, the mechanisms behind organic management, uh, doing variety trials as well, and then decided, what the heck, let's get right into plant breeding. And decided to go to a participatory plant breeding to bring new varieties to these systems. PPB offered opportunities both ways for farmers to get to know him and for him to know more farmers. And uh, the project's just expanded uh, crazily, really. Uh, Michelle Karkner, who sent me this information, is a graduate student with the project and has taken part for several years. Two uh, big areas of their work would be oats and wheat. So we have uh, several cycles of selection with a group of oat lines with uh, 15 farmers. Then an oat breeder compared their favorite lines with some of hers, and she decided to move forward a, a nice sized group of the lines selected by the, uh, the farmers. So apparently farmers actually can identify lines that are exceptional and worthy of moving forward. Because I guarantee you, if you see how breeders do it, you know you can do it too. These lines are being entered in organic evaluations across Canada and they're hoping very much that a few of these will be released through the certified seed system. So actually might get some to be official. Okay. Also a uh, very similar process with wheat. Uh, slightly more farmers, uh, three years looking at 50 different wheat lines. However, wheat uh, registration is a lot tighter than oat registration and so this doesn't look like it's going forward in the same way. But they have found that uh, as long as the farmers want to grow the variety themselves for sale as food or feed, that's fine. So they have found some improved varieties that farmers can grow and keep the seed um, themselves. And um, they also used university equipment to help the farmers move from that uh, initial breeder size quantity of seed to something they can plant on their fields. And I guarantee you, if you've ever wanted to go from a handful of seed to something you can plant on 400 acres, you need more than a sickle and you need more than a 40 foot combine. There's a whole lot of intermediate steps and the university people helped uh, cover that gap. 
Michelle's now moved on and she's studying some of these wheat lines to look at why it is that these lines were exceptional. She thinks it might have something to do with uh, phosphorus tolerance and uptake. So she's going to study those for a PhD. Okay. Take home message. Farmers who are passionate are the ones who succeed. Consistent communication is important to make one of these projects go. And variety registration doesn't always happen. Oh well. This is a fun little project I just heard about. Uh, this is just like the, uh, the Dark Star Zucchini, a uh, dehybridization project, as some of the gardeners like to call it. Uh, the folks at Fruition Seeds, uh, Petra and Matthew, with guidance from uh, Michael Mazurek uh, at Cornell University, went through the steps of, of breeding the descendants from a, a, a uh, hybrid that they especially liked because the hybrid was being dropped and they would no longer be getting those seeds. So if you could uh, see if we can play a little bit of that video. I don't think we'll get the sound, but uh, just look at the enthusiasm. All right. Okay, that's Petra. She is excited as all get out. This is what happens when you breed things. You have new children in your hands. They matter. You have to take care of them. You found them among all these many. You found the one, the needle in the haystack. She is telling us here how amazing this one is because it tastes good. Not only is it uniform and sellable, but it has flavor. It was selected specifically for flavor. That's not what you always expect in zucchinis. But she enjoyed the process and she's got a brand new uh, variety to sell. So that's exciting. Okay, we can drop out and go back to to me. Anyway, uh, you can find Petra online. She's so effusive. Very happy with this. I'm just a crusty old Slav. I keep my enthusiasm to myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> switching gears to the Northeast, uh, still small grains, which are very popular for this, this process. Um, Lisa kissing Kutsik. Uh, sent me this information. She took part in several of these projects. She is a, uh, a breeder in, with uh, USDA ARS at, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As a graduate student, she took part in this project in Maine, Vermont, and New York with farmers and the universities there looking for spring wheat. So they were selecting spring wheat for weed competitiveness, again, a really nice thing to have, uh, for yield and for vigor. And what they found eventually were several different varieties that were much more vigorous and uh, weed competitive than what they had that were still, at least even with what anyone else had as far as yield and standability and the rest. So something, uh, an, an extra useful genetic tool for dealing with weeds. She's also done another project more recently uh, from North Dakota to Pennsylvania looking at winter cover crops, uh, winter peas and hairy vetch. I knew where the hairy vetch was that was winter hardy and I told her and she, she found that that was easy. The guys in North Dakota had it. <laughs> They've been growing hairy vetch for years. If it wasn't going to survive, it didn't get reproduced. So the farmers adapted that pretty handily. So. That was, uh, that was easy. Winter peas here. Here's a nice planting of winter peas in the fall. You can see all the different experimental plots. You see a little bit of variation for vigor, but everybody's there. Oh no! <laughs> Everything didn't make it. 9% survival. That is, for growers, an absolute disaster. However, the survivors are the keepers. Again, nature does most of the breeding if you work with her. So eventually the survivors of this disaster, a couple years later, were the most winter hardy ones in their multi-state trial. And I believe this variety is going to be released sometime before too long. So pretty cool. Way beyond the Austrian winter peas you've ever seen before. Her take home with doing several of these projects is it's really important to know the farmers you work with if you're a breeder. As someone who has been, played both sides of this, I can tell you if you're a farmer, you want to do good interviews with your breeder and make sure they're, they've got it together. Both sides have to be good partners. For best results, researchers should source small scale equipment because there's a lot of small scale stuff that happens 
in this process. You have to go from three foot long rows to 160 acre fields to eventually. There's a lot of different size equipment that fits. You don't want to use that five foot combine for the whole darn show and that 40 footer is just too much to clean out when you're doing those little five foot plots. Um, multiple collaborators are the best because disasters do happen. So it's good to have a good sized team. If you ever get one of these started, get all your friends together. All right, this is a slightly different project. I don't know if the folks involved actually saw this as participatory breeding, but watch how farmers are involved in a part of this process in a very fresh and different way. All right, it started off some years back now, really, uh, a collaboration between uh, North Carolina State University, I can say that word, uh, Rural Advancement Foundation International and Organic Farmers, looking at corn, soybeans, wheat, and peanuts. Out of this, I don't know what happened with the uh, wheat and the peanuts. I haven't talked to those breeders for years now. But six varieties of soybeans specifically adapted to organic production were released, and those are being grown by organic farmers and sold as organically certified seed. So big win. However, corn was more of a mess. So in North Carolina, to deal with the situation of having untreated seed and a lot of outcrossing with transgenic corn nearby, Farmers are planting late. They have enough season, they can do this. But early hybrids from the Midwest don't have the disease package you need to deal with uh, life down in the deep south. So what to do? Also, can you buy organically produced seeds down there? No. Organic market is so small, no one's bothering to produce organically produced seed. That's not uncommon up here either. So, how to deal with all these problems for, for corn? NCSU went to the organic farmers and they did multiple trials on organic farms with variety, or hybrid varieties produced from university lines. And they found two superior hybrids, just right up there. Excellent for silage, pretty darn decent for grain, but, Inbred lines are hard to grow under organic management because some of the inbreds are kind of wimpy. Some are better than most open pollinated corn varieties you've ever seen, but some are bad. So, went back to an old trick. Go ahead. NCSU sends hybrid seeds and the farmers on their organic farms are making double cross hybrids between two hybrids. It's an old trick from the 30s and 40s and 50s, still works. They got a great one there. It's easy to produce. And 11 farmers on five farms are now producing this seed. And pretty soon they hope to have enough production going that they can start selling to other farmers across North Carolina. I've seen their production numbers. They're really, really good. Their, uh, their hybrid is uh, second in organic trials for silage production. It's virtually indistinguishable from the very best single cross hybrids. So very exciting. They presented their goals. They didn't do the intermediate breeding, but they are now doing the seed release. So it is still a participatory project in my mind. A few of you are familiar with Northern Plains Sustainable Ag Society, and I worked with them for some years with our farm breeding club. One of our big projects was working on cover crops. Here are two crops that really came along pretty well. The first is radishes to be used as a fall cover crop. So, on a farm, and I, I could tell, if, if, if anyone here know NPSAS members? Okay, a couple of you. Anyway, <clears throat> Emily Stiglmeyer, Northern South Dakota, on her farm, in her garden, did the initial screen of dozens of different kinds of radish. We all came out one lovely day in the fall, we dug the roots, we raided them, and we identified the eight very best varieties. We sent those seeds or additional seeds of those to uh, Katrina Becker in central Wisconsin and for three years on her organic farm she grew those, let them intermate and developed our new uh, thoroughly mixed uh, genetically diverse population. Then planting after wheat harvest uh, we let them grow until they were actually quite small yet but we uh, dug things in early November and uh, 
picked the biggest, healthiest, most vigorous growers, sent those to another farmer's uh, potato storage facility to overwinter these tiny undersized plants. In the following spring, uh, sent them to Don, who uh, grew those out and let them intermate. A new cycle of selection was done. Those seeds came back, were replanted in South Dakota, another cycle of selection was carried forward, and so on. The project's been moving along with hit or miss as, as the, the club's gone along. We still do have seeds of these. We've got a really nice population. Unfortunately, the grout in 2019 was mostly demolished by bad weather because, as the other gal said, 10 to 20% of sites seem to have problems. Well, unluckily, this time it was ours. But <clears throat> that radish is coming along. They want to call it pink tractor for some reason. It's purple. It's pretty. The other one we worked with is cowpeas, which is an unusual crop for North Dakota and South Dakota. Now, the South Dakota folks did a lot of work in the 80s and 90s with this crop and proved to us that it was of, of potential value in the Dakotas. We actually convinced uh, a grantor that this was worth doing, although they were, they were sure that there's no point in bringing an African crop or perhaps a southern USA crop to North Dakota. It's the dumbest thing you ever heard. We screened them at two locations. One spot didn't get planted. And out of 96 different lines, there were about 15 that actually produced any seeds at all. Most people say, throw it away. Yeah? You got cowpeas to reproduce in North Dakota? Oh, yeah. So what did we do with those? We cheated. We sent those seeds to Puerto Rico so we could blow them up over the winter at their organic farm. And those came back. And for several years, we went back and forth, evaluating them with university researchers in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Everybody is able to grow them. Evaluate, have the farmers look at it. Everyone thinks about what we want to do. Send them back to uh, Puerto Rico to increase in the winter as we slowly build up our seed supply, which is especially important because we had a lot of troubles with um, uh, weevils. Puerto Rico has weevils that get in the seeds, so if we didn't plant things, they didn't stay in storage long, <laughs> unless we froze them to kill the bugs. Um, we did some seed increases of the most promising lines. Been struggling, however, uh, because officially naming things is hard. Getting them in the seed certification system has been very difficult. And uh, the yields are not amazing in North Dakota proper, but in other locations, I expect they do very, very well. Uh, we, we did see in, in I mean, some years, some varieties scarcely produced a thing. Sometimes it's only four or 500 pounds the acre. That's useless. Other situations, these same varieties were producing 2,500 pounds of the acre, which is pretty nice for a cowpea this far north. Varieties from Botswana, they were great. In order to deal with this, we started making some crosses to generate new diversity that could be certified eventually, but it will take a few years. And uh, we're going to select among those descendants and move forward with cowpeas. I expect we're going to see cowpeas all across the region because there are some that are pretty well adapted for one, and two, it's getting warmer. So between those two, I think we're going to see them. It's a really exciting new uh, pulse crop eventually. All right, take home messages from our Farm Breeding Club work. Uh, funding is difficult. If you're a farm organization, because this is PPB reverse. This was farmers going to breeders and agronomists. So we, you know, it can go both ways. But funding is hard. Uh, grants usually don't last very long, so funding plant breeding, which is frequently a six to ten year process, uh, is, it's hard to do. You really need a lot of volunteer time probably and uh, someone who writes grants to keep it rolling. Uh, other things to do right from the get-go to be successful, make sure you're communicating. The whole team needs to be talking. If you're not talking, humans wander off in weird directions and then they wonder what everyone's doing and then they're all fighting. Communication is key. Uh, choose interested farmers and breeders. Everyone's going to really want to do this because it's extra work. It's interesting work. It's things farmers and gardeners have done for thousands of years, but a lot of us aren't used to doing this or have really huge scale enterprises already underway. So interested people need to be there. Find appropriately sized equipment. Uh, I can tell you working with NDSU was awesome. 
um, learn about the seed laws and policies. Uh, learn that if you're going to sell seeds, you need a license. Um, there's <laughs> you have to have it germ tested. There's a lot of things that have to happen. If you want to name a variety, there's hoops to go through for that. If you want them certified and sold officially, there's many hoops to go through there. Learn about those early. Link up with field trial, seed increase, and marketing professionals. These folks are important. They do good jobs. Uh, very helpful. Uh, we teamed up with Pulse USA, which is a co-op uh, of farmers who produce and sell pulse crop seeds. Very, very helpful for our cowpea enterprise. Uh, and then working with the NDSU in Minnesota, SDSU in Wisconsin is really good. And then if there's going to be any money made, figure out way up front what you're going to do about that. Nothing ruins cooperation like money. Someone's always certain they're not getting it or getting the right amount or someone's getting more. Talk about it way up front. If there's money, it will make problems. If there's no money, it will certainly make even more problems. <laughs> but do talk about it and make some plans. Okay, I'm going to put in a quick plug for uh, my new uh, patrons. Uh, uh, Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin. Our college is a 1994 land grant. It's been there for about 20 years, but we've just gotten to the point where we're big enough now that we've taken on an agricultural research project. Here's one of our students, uh, Adam Scholes, who is a um, member of the Stockbridge Muncie Tribe, which uh, is right nearby, uh, standing in a, a field of flint corn. We're looking at flint corn and soil health. Uh, production and management issues around a very ancient kind of gardening system. What looks like ruts in the woods there, that is a garden. That is a garden from 400 years ago. It is a raised bed field and I believe the total acreage there is about two and a half acres. As it turns out, there were raised bed fields all across central and northern Wisconsin and parts of the UP from 1600 on back to about 500 AD. So we're trying to figure out how that system works. We're looking at different kinds of inputs that of course are natural. Um, no one on the reservation wants to touch herbicides or chemical fertilizers. So although I don't know if anyone's actually interested in certified organic production, whatever we find and understand about this system, I'm sure will be of some interest to organic gardeners and the rest. Um, but the archeologists have had no end of fun with that. Believe it or not, you know, a thousand years ago, central Wisconsin, corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and other crops are all being grown on many, many acres all across the place. Whatever we learn is going to be brought out to the Menominee community and everything is considered via this, the uh, Menominee Theoretical Model for Sustainability. So when we consider all six of these aspects, we'll figure out what things are probably sustainable and useful for the tribe in the long run. It's a system they created for managing their forest. Look at a uh, satellite photo of Wisconsin. You can find the reservation. It's the forest that's shaped like uh, the state of Nebraska. Is it Nebraska? I think it's shaped like Nebraska. It has a little panhandle on it. Anyway, they have a marvelous forest there because they've uh, been putting uh, sustainable practices in place for some time. Okay, then to summarize. Set goals, make plans, expect to have a lot of fun. Don't let the diversity overwhelm you. When you make a diverse population, it's crazy how many different things there are. Focus, otherwise you will get lost in the maze of excitement, I, I, I guarantee. Find team members who are dedicated to the work. You can find excellent new tools and great friendships and perhaps find better ways to make better crops for everybody. Find the tools that will fit the scope of your work at the moment, whether they be hand tools or, or large equipment or small. Improved varieties do result. Expect that when you select things, you will get what you want, but it does take time. Know the seed laws, the needs of seed producers, uh, of, of the varieties and things. Get to know people who are gonna be eating these things. Know the whole train from production to eating. Uh, they keep telling us this in agriculture all the time, that it's good to know where things go and make sure you have a premium. You can do this right from the get-go if you make sure that uh, nutritional quality and food quality and the rest are built into the varieties that are selected. All right. Don't expect to get rich. <laughs> 
Expect interesting things to happen. If you're successful, expect some good things to come along. And if we're lucky, God willing, we'll get by. But as far as taking on Monsanto with your brand new variety zucchini, I just don't know. All right. Thanks to so many people, Salvador Ciccarelli and all these many people all across the country who supplied this information I've presented to you today and have inspired uh, Farm Breeding Club and many more of us uh, for many, many years. In the language of my patrons, Wawanan, and the language of my ancestors, Jankuya, thank you so much for your time. I'll be happy to entertain your questions.